our ongoing series of webinars where we bring on uh, professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write, edit, publish, market uh, better books. Uh, and this week uh, we're on a base of a traditional publishing kick uh, because we've brought along uh, uh, an honest to goodness uh, New York uh, literary agent. Uh, I always tack on New York there because an uh, ongoing series of webinars just where we bring on uh, here myself uh, professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write. Well, that's embarrassing. Uh, I opened the a YouTube window just so I can see all the comments go down. And uh, you can probably guess by that what kind of delay uh, we're getting off uh, on this one. So from me speaking to uh, it actually reaching the world was probably about 20 seconds. But I am very glad to have you uh, on board today. Uh, we're doing uh, a query letter a critique. Uh, we've done a bunch of critiques in the past where uh, book cover one, uh, first line ones, uh, but it's been ages. I, I'm not sure. I think right at the start of Reading, we may have had one of these, but uh, thankfully, uh, we're bringing it back. And with us today will be John Darger. Uh, as I mentioned, he's an Ask the Goodness um, New York literary agent. Uh, he's done another talk on, um, on submissions for us before, and he's back uh, to look at query letters that you have submitted to us uh, and show you where they can be improved, where they're great. Uh, and the sort of things that would catch his eye uh, as an agent uh, going through his uh, slush pile every week. Um, just to give you an idea, earlier last week, I sent around a newsletter to uh, people who are subscribed to the Readsy newsletter, asking folks to send in their query letters. Um, we kind of picked them almost at random. We weren't looking for good ones or bad ones. We were just looking for a bit of a range. Uh, so if yours isn't picked, uh, just know that almost 400 query letters were sent in, uh, and you'll be in very good company. Uh, however, it's uh, coming up to 8 o'clock my time, uh, 3 p.m. on the East Coast, midday on the West Coast. Uh, I think it's about half past midnight in Delhi and 3 a.m. in Singapore. And let's just throw in, uh, it's probably about 5 a.m. in Sydney. So uh, anybody in Sydney, thank you for joining us. Or Melbourne, uh, where it's been locked down, or Auckland or Christchurch. Uh, but yeah, okay, it's, 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 we're on the hour. Uh, let's bring the man on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. John Darger. Hey, John, uh, give me a second. I've just muted you for a second, and here we go. How are you? That's probably best for the, for the chat to keep me muted. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing all right, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm not bad. I noticed uh, that you're uh, you calling us on a mobile phone. A, uh, a lovely segue, yes. Um, there was a, uh, a thunderstorm earlier this afternoon, uh, knocked down our internet, so I'm currently, I had, I had a whole, lovely uh, computer monitor set up with the lighting and the, you know, I had the screen to look at the queries and to do this. And now I'm, I'm doing this on my phone. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, well, before, uh, I let you go, before I let you go, I'm just going to ask a few things of our viewers at home. First of all, uh, please like this video. It's good for uh, helping us share it. Uh, it's good for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be pretty awesome. Uh, and also, uh, if you can keep in mind that, as I mentioned, we have 400 people sending their query letters. Uh, it's too late to send anyone in. Someone's going to be in the comments asking where they can send in their query letters. Uh, they can't anymore. Sorry, but hopefully we'll do another one of these. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, ask them throughout and then ask them again at the end. Uh, yeah, uh, John, is there anything you need from me? Otherwise, maybe uh, you could uh, say a bit more about yourself and we'll get this thing started. Yeah. Um... I am, as you've already queued me up very well as a New York literary agent, um, I, um, I've been in publishing for about, what is it, six years at this point. Um, I started out as an editor at Penguin Random House um, for between about four and a half years, um, and then I moved over to the agenting world, so I have... Um, a lot of experience in, in all aspects of the publishing realm. Um, and now I do my agenting work and um, stuff like this with Readsy. So I am open um, to all clients on Readsy. Um, if, if you like this chat and, and want to work together, I do um, copy edits, full manuscript edits, um, developmental edits, query letter reviews. So um, I hope that I'll be able to connect with some of you on your projects. All right, you ready? Oh, cool. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to bring this thing up. Okay. Corner. Okay, hopefully everyone at home can see, but uh, John can do that. All right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to apologize um, a little bit in advance. Um, if I, I think the framing is pretty good, and Martin and I tooled around with the font size. Um, but if I end up kind of going a little close to my face to read um, 
the query letters, I'll just apologize in advance um, and blame the downed internet. Um, so what we are going to do is I'm going to read through these query letters, um, just kind of do a dramatic reading at first, um, just so I can, these are all, I, I think an important thing to mention too, is that I'm blind reading these. Um, I have not been introduced to or read any of these query letters before this live broadcast. So I am reading them, uh, for the first time and forming opinions for the first time as you are. So, um, as I read them aloud, that is my opportunity to read this letter um, and uh, kind of formulate what I'm going to say about it in my head. Um, the first few will probably take a little bit longer just because I'm setting up um, kind of the basics of like the structure and what you definitely want to have in there and what you don't need to have in there. Um, and then as we kind of go through the, um, through the queries, the, the latter ones will, will probably be a little bit shorter because we'll have developed uh, a shorthand. So here's the dramatic reading of the first one. And also, if there's anyone listening, um, I, I'm available for audiobook readings if you're really digging um, this seminar and want to, to hire me for audiobooks. A um, little publishing humor. Dear Juliet Collins, I believe that's the fake name uh, that Martin gave you to address your career letters to. Um, <clears throat> have you ever been to Leavenworth, Washington? It's a beautiful small town with many attractions near the town, such as a big river to go kayaking on and mountains to hike through. That's where the story takes place. Piper Adams, a 16-year-old girl, drowns in the river while kayaking with her close friends, Norman, Daniel, and Livia. The first chapter opens up a year after Piper's death. The trio is distant, but what better way to bring back a group by coming together to solve a mystery? People in the town of Leavenworth, Washington, are starting to go missing, and it doesn't seem like an innocent coincidence to Livia, Norman, and Daniel. This mystery novel is about true friendship. It's told from three different points of views, Norman, Daniel, and Liv, as they try to figure out who is behind these missing people and how is this person connected to Piper's death. The book ends with a big reveal. Piper is found alive and has been on the run all this time, thus ending with the readers at the edge of their seats. I'm hoping there to be a second and third book as well to create a book series. This is my first novel as a writer. I'm in college right now, uh, heading for a degree in music composition and psychology. Thank you for your consideration and advice, and I hope this query letter pleases you. Okay, good. I have some thoughts on this. Um, the reason that I, I chuckled a little bit was not because of the query letter or the writing, by the way. It was because um, I had in my mind what I wanted to say about it, and then I read a line that kind of perfectly illustrated um, what I was going to say. So the chuckle was like a self-satisfied um, chuckle and not reflective of the work. In any way, I just want to make that clear. Um, so the first thing that I want to say, which is why what I was thinking in my head as I read it, and that's why I chuckled, um, is that a, a lot of people, um, as is the case here, uh, tend to think of a query letter almost as a synopsis. Um, that is I don't think the correct way to think of a query letter. Um, a query letter is uh, like flap copy or back cover copy. Flap copy is for a hardcover when you open it and you see those flaps um, on the jacket and um, paperback copy is like the back cover copy when you just flip it over and it's on the back. Um, so if you read um, any of those copy as samples, um, you'll see that it, it doesn't give the, God, what's the phrase? Like the, the, whatever with the hand basket it doesn't give it doesn't give everything away all at once um you're you're teeing the reader up to hit um oh god i was gonna say you're teeing the reader up to hit a home run which i think is mixing golf and baseball um so that they are curious about the book but they they want to read it so in the case of this particular query letter it's more of a synopsis um we we get at the very end that Piper is still alive, um, that, you know, that this whole, we kind of get a, a conclusion to the conspiracy. And we don't want that in a query letter because your agent that you're trying to land is your first reader. And you want to give them the same experience as a reader picking the book up in the store. Um, I will be less likely to be intrigued by this book um, if... I already know how it ends because I'm assuming that a large part of this book that's a mystery novel um, is the mystery. And if I know 
what's going to happen, then that element is, um, is, is removed. Um, I'm sorry if I'm getting distracted by notifications popping up on my phone, which I forgot to turn off before this. Um, so that's one note that I would have. So in this instance, um, and it's going to be a little touch and go for me to um, totally rewrite a query letter, um, staring at it on my phone screen. But in this instance, um, I would, I, I think that opening paragraph is, it's a nice hook. I like, have you ever been to Leavenworth, Washington? But um, if you read, or if you um, read about or uh, participated in my first Read Z uh, live critique, it was about the first 10 pages of a manuscript and how to snare an agent or any reader, really, with those first 10 pages. And one of the bits of advice that I gave was not to start with a prologue. You want to start your your book at the last possible point of action. And what a prologue does usually is it sets up that point of action rather than just getting there. Um, so to me, this is a lovely scene-setting paragraph. Um, Have you ever been to Leavenworth, Washington? I think is a good start. Um, but it, it's a bit of a prologue paragraph. It, it sets it up. It says, here are the attractions that you can do. Here uh, is the nature. Here are the characters. Um, and that is not really important to the ultimate thrust of the book, which is this mystery. So that's one thing that kind of um, flagged me off. It did capture my attention. I think that it's well written. Um, but when I got to the second paragraph, it struck me as kind of a false lead. Um, and, and like it was maybe making it out to be more of a, you know, travel guide or, um, kind of a literary, um, uh, Marilyn Robinson style, um, you know, portrait of a small village than, than the mystery that it is. So that's one thing. Another thing that I would just call out here is, um, to be really careful of repetition. So, um, for example, in this query letter, if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm scanning it right now, I think Norman, Daniel, and Liv are repeated three or four times um, in just these first couple of paragraphs. Um, yes, Martin. <laughs> I love how Martin's following along and, and demonstrating for me. That's that's really helpful. Um, you, you want to make sure that you're not repeating yourself because it's such a small um, and short form that you're that you're writing in that it really stands out if you're kind of hitting the same phrases over and over again. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you're, you're avoiding that. So I, um, I, I think just to kind of spiral and mitigate this, um, I would say that she drowns in the river while kayaking with her close friends. I would not maybe give their names there. Um, I maybe the second time you would say it doesn't seem like an innocent coincidence to Piper's friends, uh, Livia, Norman, and Daniel. And then, uh, and this is the third time when you do it, uh, you could say like told in their um, three distinctive point of views. Um, another thing that I'll just throw in there is we don't get a sense of any of the characters in this. Um, Piper is dead. I mean, presumed dead. Um, and we know who Norman, Livia, and Daniel are in relation to the dead girl, presumed dead girl. Um, but we don't get any sense of who they are as individuals. We don't know if they're struggling with their grief, if they're struggling with loss, if they're, um, if they, sorry, I'm, I'm scanning through it again. Um, you know, how suspicious they are. Maybe Livia's suspicious and Norman um, is thinks that she, it was an innocent drowning and Daniel is, um, you know, suspicious, but he's scared. Um, so even adding an adjective before each of them, um, you know, it doesn't seem like an innocent coincidence to Piper's friends. Um, tomboy, Livia, um, scaredy cat, Norman, and, um, you know, school bully Daniel or, or something. Um, again, it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, I, I, I don't, I say all of these tips and tricks with the full knowledge that it's really, really hard to capture the nuances of character and plot in two or three paragraphs like this. Um, 
I do it when I write a pitch letter and I send the project out to editors. I have to do the same thing as a query letter. And um, sometimes it takes me multiple drafts and multiple days to to get it just right. So I, I empathize and I totally understand. Um, but those little tricks, um, the kind of adding one word in here or one word in there really helps. So I will close out on this one shortly, but I, I, I will, um, I'm going to try to see if I can kind of scratch rewrite on the fly. Um, I would skip the scene setting in front. Um, I would start with the point of action, as I mentioned earlier. So I would say, um, I would, I would start out by saying something like when Piper Adam, when 16 year old Piper Adams drowns, um, drowns while kayaking, um, the town, uh, the town, uh, uh, grieves the, the tragic accident. Um, you know, her, her friends don't, you know, a year later, um, after X more people have died, uh, Piper's friends start to think that it's not an accident. Um, uh, and then kind of go into, you know, maybe, maybe why, maybe build up the intrigue since you're, you're not going to have as much space dedicated to giving us a synopsis, maybe say what happened. Um, what, what are the, what are the connections between these deaths that, that maybe make the friends think that it's not an accident? Um, maybe Piper notices something first and she goes to Daniel and Norman to convince them. And that gives us a sense of who she is. She's the intelligent go-getter who, um, who, is is piecing all these piece, puzzle pieces together, um, and then you kind of want to end on like a dot dot dot, um, you know, wh where it's it's teasing the rest of the book. So in this case, I would say, um, you know, uh, I would say something like you know, you set up the case and that things are wrong, and then you say something like you know testing the, the, the bonds of their true friendship. Um, Piper, sorry, not Piper. She's dead. Presumed dead. <laughs> um, testing the bonds of their friendship. Um, Livia, Norman and Daniel um, set out to investigate um, these, these deaths and, or disappearances. Um, what they find might uh, tear their small town apart, you know, at, at, at the core and forever change um the foundation of their friendship um, or the course of their lives or, or something like that. Um, and then kind of have that don't, don't actually use a dot, dot, dot. That's a little cliche. Um, and I, I, it would raise my eyebrow, but um, that kind of tagline of, you know, what they discover may change them forever. And then just leave that hanging. We don't need to know that, that Piper is alive and going to come back. We don't need to know um, what the themes of the book are um, by saying, you know, this will test the bonds of their friendship. You're cueing us into um, to the fact that friendship will be a theme of the book without explicitly stating that friendship will be a theme of the book. Um, okay, we spent about ten minutes on that one. I, I, it's going to take all day if we if we don't move on. So, um, yeah, uh, just we'll move on. <laughs> If you want to fix your notifications, I'll happily tap down some promote some stuff for, for an No, you're you're. I, it was only a few early on, and now they're they're gone. So Great. I think it's okay. Great. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next one, Sugar Bee. Okay, Sugar Bee, to Juliet, our lovely fake agent. I read on your blog that you're a foodie and think my LGBTQ and a foodie manuscript might be a great fit. An emotional wreck after her parents' unexpected death, 18-year-old B. Taylor finds solace in frying up Southern comfort food, but dinner for one is no fun. When renowned chef Bertie Sauer announces Macon's first ever televised fry-off, B. seizes the opportunity. But a rival flame, diabetes, and an unlikely competitor all threaten to outweigh her ambition. Self-taught Beatrix Taylor's frying skills earn her the opportunity to compete in the first ever televised fry-off. But working in front of an audience is different than cooking in her kitchen. Her proportions are off, it's faster paced, and her fried foods are too bland. The older competitors consistently earn Birdie's praise, praise period. And then there's Holland. She's the same age as Bee, and her fried foods are artful as much as they are mouthwatering. But much worse, with each passing week, Bee falls for Holland. Ooh, intrigue. 
When Holland asks to be out on a date, she refuses at first, after, after all their competitors. But like a decadent dessert, B finds her hard to resist, so she says yes. The pressure weighs on B. Winning her rounds proves harder and harder. Still, B somehow manages to stay in the competition while looking forward to her and Holland's first date. But the date hits a sour note when B struggles to focus. She passes out and is rushed to the hospital. Tests determine she has type 2 diabetes, <clears throat> which turns her signature dishes into a personal poison. <laughs> B worries she's blown her chances with Holland, and on the end, unable to test what she creates, proves torturous, but her fried mac and cheese pleases everyone else's palate. She's in the final fry-off, and certain she'll win. But, but, the, there, but there's one tiny problem. She'll have to face off with the most unlikely competitor. Sugar Bee, a 70,000-word new adult LGBTQ novel, is Taste Test. My screen is not scrolling down, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> by Kelly Fiore, blended with um, Blue Bistro by Elon Hildebrand. I'm an active member of SCBWI. In 2010 and 2017, I won the Writers League of Texas Middle Grade Manuscript Contest for the, I don't know if that's Ruins or R-U-I-N-S, at Fiddlefern and looking for Stardust. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, this is, this is very good. Um, I, I think um, that... Martin, would you be able to scroll up to the top of that letter again? Thank you. Um, I love this first paragraph. Um, one thing that I will kind of say as a caveat is that your first paragraph of query letters may vary. I uh, sorry, your mileage may vary. Um, it's kind of personal, and there's not one right or wrong answer. Um, I think that the right, the best way to start off a query letter is with whatever will get you the most attention. So if you're a first time debut fiction writer, um, uh, that might just be the plot of the book and just getting right in there and saying, here's what my book is about. And the agent will go, yes, that's exciting. Um, if you're in, if you've been published in many literary magazines and you're, you've won awards and, and all of that, um, that might be off. That might be starting off your letter by saying, um, dear Juliet, I have been published in XYZ magazines and have won that and kind of leading with your bio. Um, if you are friends with Tom Cruise <clears throat> and, um, he has read your novel and he thinks that his production company would be perfect to turn this into a movie once your book is published, Lead was saying, um, dear Juliet, I'm thrilled to send you this manuscript, which my close good friend, Tom Cruise, um, has, is interested in optioning for a movie. Um, whatever is the strongest hook, um, I would lead with that. And I think... In 99% of cases, not 99, that's a large number, like 85, 90% of cases, it's probably going to be just starting with the synopsis. Um, but in this case, it's personalized. And I really like that. Um, I think that agents respond really well when you show that you've done research into their, their list and their interests and um, that you're not just blind querying a bunch of authors at the same time. Um, so this is a really good start. And I do, um, I always read all queries that are submitted to me. Um, and I don't give uh, special treatment to ones that puff up my ego, but they do immediately capture my attention and make me want to read more. Um, so this would definitely do the trick. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with this, but I do think that if there are other authors um, that the that the agent represents who um, uh, you know who are maybe LGBTQ uh, new adult authors. Um, you could say, I think my LGBTQ NA foodie manuscript might be a great fit for your list alongside um, you know author one and author two, who I really enjoy. Um, and on that note, um, Martin, when you get a chance, if you could scroll back down to the bottom again, I'm so sorry for making you um, trawl all over the place. Um, while we're talking, I've gotten a lot of questions when I do query letter reviews for a ReadZ about comps. Um, authors don't like them. Agents kind of think they're annoying. Um, I think it's really helpful. I think... Um, it's really important to know um, where where your book will sit on the bookshelf and who you're you're talking to emulate, um, who you're talking to emulate, who you're trying to emulate, um, and and just kind of giving an agent those buzzwords to to cue in. So, for example, I'm a big fan of David Mitchell, and if you said um, my 
book, um, you know, blends the, you know, kind of fun, whimsical, magic realism of David Mitchell with whatever that would trigger my attention. Um, or if you, especially if it's one of my authors, like if I represented David Mitchell and you said my book blends the fun, magic realism of David Mitchell with um, whatever, that would immediately capture my attention. So if there are any comps that you can use, kind of linking in with what I said earlier about um, personalizing to the agent's specific list, if there are any comps that you can use that either um, are represented by that agency or that are represented by that agent, that's a really clutch move. and I do recommend it. Um, these comps are good. Um, they give me a sense of, um, you know, why the author is comping to these titles. Um, I would add um, uh, an adjective or two to them. So rather than say, is Taste Test blended with Blue Bistro, I would say um, takes the um, inside look at the foodie world offered by Taste Test and combines it with the commercial romance of Blue Bistro, excuse me, by Elon Hillenbrand. Um, I have not read either of those books, so I don't know if those adjectives are correct, but um, just using a phrase or two that gives the agent a look at why you're comping to those titles is, is really helpful um, just to kind of hone it down. Um, this is also a good author bio. Um, you don't need a robust author bio um, to draw an agent's attention. We, we do work with debut fiction authors all the time who have not been published in, in literary magazines who don't necessarily have um, even creative writing degrees or English degrees. Um, that's fine. That doesn't matter. Um, but saying that you're an active member of SCBWI and that you won um, the contest and all of that, um, that's really good. Um, again, as with the comps, I don't know what the ruins at Fiddle Fern and looking for Stardust are. Um, I don't even know what their genres are. So um, that would be really helpful for me if you said, you know, I won the manuscript contest. Oh, I guess it says teen middle grade manuscript contest. Okay, so that does give some context. Um, if if there are other foodie romance kind of rom-com style books, um, it would be really helpful to know if you've won awards for books in the same genre. Um, just giving us a little more context for what those works are that you're citing. Um, moving back up to the, um, thank you, Martin, to the um, book description. Um, again, as with the first, this, is, this starts off really strongly. Um, uh, can you scroll up a little bit more, Martin? Would you mind? Thank you. That's perfect. Um, this, the first paragraph here feels like it's starting at the right point. An emotional wreck after her parents' unexpected death. Is that, I don't, I'm not sure if that's both parents or one parent. Um, if it's one parent, I would just say her mother or her father's unexpected death. Um, the apostrophe might be in a weird spot. I'm not sure. Um, 18 old beauty finds solace. Din that's, I mean, but dinner for one is no fun is a really good tagline. Um, I really like that. That captured my attention. Um, the televised fry off. I mean, this is, this is a really tight paragraph because even at the end, when you say a rival flame, diabetes and an unlikely competitor all threaten to outweigh her ambition. You get a sense of all of the elements that you're going to be dealing with in the book and the things that you're going to play with. Um, but you're not overwhelming us. You're an agent's not going to read that and go, Oh my God, you're spending a whole paragraph on these things. It's the, it's what it's leaving us wanting more. I want to know, Oh shit. How does diabetes? I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on Reezy live. I hope so. Um, <laughs> oh, oh shoot. Um, how, uh, how does diabetes come in? Does she have it? Does one of her competitors get it? Um, who is the unlikely competitor? What's the rival flame? Really great. This is a really great first paragraph. As we move on, uh, we, we are getting a little bit more into the plot synopsis um, that I described earlier. So again, the second paragraph is still pretty good because it's offering new information um, and it's still setting up the book with the fry off. Um, the fact that she's struggling to adapt, the fact that she's falling for her, um, her competitor, really intriguing. It's still setting up new information. It's still, um, building what the book is going to offer. I would stop there. Um, that's enough for me. I, I don't, 
I, I think that talking about asking her out on a date and then refusing and then she says yes and then they go on a date and it's kind of weird and then she get that's getting too much in the synopsis of it all. So first two paragraphs are really well written, really tight, um, give us a sense of character, give us a sense of the obstacles the character will face. It gives us a sense of the voice of the book. Um, I feel like this query letter is written in the same kind of um, commercial uh, hooky tone that the book might be written in, which is really appealing. Um, but I would stop with saying with each passing week befalls for Holland. Um, and then do that short third plot paragraph that I kind of talked about earlier. So I would end it again with that ellipsis and saying much worse with each passing week B falls for Holland. Um, uh, as they, as B tries to balance her, her budding relationship or budding feelings or, or whatever it is um, with the unexpected rigors of the competition, she, you know, may find, she finds that um, she's having trouble juggling both, um, you know, will, she she soon realizes that she's that she'll have to choose between a true chance at at, at love and, and companionship or um making her parents proud and winning the competition they've always wanted her to win. Um again, leaving us with that dot 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 question mark so that we're thinking, oh, what will she choose? Um what you know, what obstacles will she face? That sort of thing. Um and then I delete the rest of the plot after that. I know as a disclaimer, by the way, that the, the writing that I'm coming up with off the top of my head is not, like, award-winning. Um, I'm mostly just trying to get the point um, across because it's very hard to write and then edit what you're writing while you're speaking extemporaneously. Um, okay, I think that is enough for that. It's been another 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I'll be faster as we move on because I'm kind of setting up the building blocks now and then cool, I'll cool. just be able to do shorthand later. Okay, Dear Ms. Collins... The Dresden Files meets Dead Like Me and Dichotomy, a 90,000 word urban fantasy with serious potential. That's a good, I'm, I'm just going to start interrupting myself a little bit. Um, serious potential is good. Um, it's a no-no to say the first book in a 10 book series um, because we don't know anything about what will happen with this first book. We don't know if a publisher will buy it. We don't know um, if, a, if it will sell well and a publisher will want to publish nine more books. Um, nobody can guarantee a 10 book series. So it's good to know that you have more planned, but it's, it's also important to know that you have other, uh, you're aware of the realis realism of the publishing industry and that you don't have all of your hopes and dreams and future pinned on this 10 series, a 10 book series happening. So series potential is, is a good line. <clears throat> um, Eric Lancaster, 25, wanders aimless through life, trying to find his place in things. With a failing heart and compromised health, he thinks there's not much he can do. At least until a series of strange incidents, including an encounter with a maybe undead child, a blind date with a paranormal investigator with legit superpowers, and a pursuit by an old flame-turned-psychotic stalker. Then he's transported to the netherworld, a realm filled with ghosts and the ethereal beings who protect them. Everyone there seems to know him, or act like he belongs there and always has. A prince, they call him, their long-lost leader. As Eric doubts his sanity, a strange voice begins whispering in his mind of things he ought to know, of memories he never lived. This is intriguing. This is a good start. Um, I, I like the laundry list of fun things. Um, laundry lists a lot of times don't work, but when you're kind of doing it tongue-in-cheek and rattling off maybe Undead Child, Blind Date with Paranormal Investigator with Legit Superpowers and a Pursuit by an Old Flame Turned Psychotic Stalker... Um, it, it, it's fun and it's kind of prodding um, prodding in, in a joking way at the, the trope of the laundry list. Um, and I think by kind of in, in injecting some voice into it, like with legit superpowers um, kind of gives you a sense of the tone of the author in the book. So um, that works for me. Um, it's a, it's a little much um, to start with a, 25 year old walking around kind of not knowing what he's going to do with his life and then dumping all of this. But, um, I get the sense that this book, um, kind of has fun in doing a lot. Um, and I, that's not a turnoff for me at this point. Um, when a demonic threat endangers the netherworld, Eric feels drawn into lending whatever help he can. His inner voice grows more demanding, almost like something or someone else is pushing him to take charge or he fears fighting its way free of him. 
Eric faces a choice. Either assume the mantle of a life he doesn't know, or let his previous persona take control, possibly wiping him from existence entirely. I don't know if you need that last paragraph. I think um, from that second paragraph, we get that he is torn between two lives now and that there might be something inside of him that he's, that he's unaware of. Um, I understand that. And I think that um, having that third paragraph is gilding, gilding the lily a little bit um, and offering us information that we can already surmise. So I wouldn't do that. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe that that's the end of the query letter. Um, I do think that even if you don't um, have a whole roster of awards and publications to your name um, that you should do and about the author, um, even if it's just saying that you graduated from whatever college with a degree in environmental science um, or what have you, um, uh, I, I, I think that that is just useful information to provide um, and kind of what drew you to writing. And then I always do like to end letters with a little bit of a... Um, Thanks so much for, for your, uh, I, what, what is the line that I use? If, if, you, if one of my clients who has gotten a query letter review is on this call, they'll recognize this line. I, I end my query letters um, with, um, thank you so much for your time and consideration. Um, I have the complete manuscript available upon request. Um, and I uh, look forward to hearing from you at your, at your earliest convenience. Um, I like that because it's gracious. Um, it lets them know that you know how the game works and that the manuscript is completed and you're ready to send it. Um, and um, at your earliest convenience is um, optimistic without being um, pushy. It's kind of saying, I expect to hear from you, but it's, it's not saying I expect to hear from you. Um, so I like that a lot. I have lost Martin's screen. Oh, there it is. I see it again. <coughs> okay, let me ask the water real quick. I have one question before we go on. Like, um, you mentioned the idea of like knowing how the game is played. Um, so now you can steal that line, and now all the agents in New York will be saying, all of my query letters end with the same line. Why is that? And they can blame me. Okay, dear Juliet Collins, after reading your interview on Readsy and noting your interest in domestic thrillers, particularly novels which feature strong female characters, I'd like you to consider representing my domestic thriller novel, Save Me, Complete at eight or three thousand words. Good opening. Personal um, shows that you're targeting that agent for a specific reason. Um, that you think you're not only because you saw their interview on Reedy, but because they um, represent that genre and have an interest in the specific um, kind of subgenre notes of the the strong female character. Good start. Jody wondered as she oops, oh there it is okay sorry. Jody wondered as she stood there watching the forensics team place little cones along the sweeping driveway leading to the Williams' house. <coughs> Excuse me. It's allergies, not COVID. Um, uh, if she would have done things differently, had she known how it would all turn out. Would she have even moved to Kensington Grove at all? Hindsight is a bitch. I like that. Um, good voice. Again, hindsight is a bitch. Gives me a sense of the tone of the book and, and the author's personality. Um, it's a, again, it's a little too much scene setting. Um, in a query letter, we don't need to know um, about the, about the sweeping driveway and about the forensics team placing, excuse me, little cones. Um, treat your first. I, I know. Um, shout out to Becca Heyman who does uh, first line reviews, uh, first line frenzies. Excuse me on Twitter and on Readsy, um, where she does cold reads like like I'm doing of the query letters of first lines of books. Um, you should watch those for tips or, or read those or look her up on Twitter. Um, she's brilliant and she's always right. And um, you should treat the first line of your query letter. This, I, I feel I'm saying, keep saying query. Um, it's a very hard word to say out loud. I've, I've realized now doing this seminar a little too late. Um, <laughs> uh, the first line of your query is the same as the first line of your book and that you don't want to overload. You want to tease, you want to give that information. So to me, this is more scene setting than we need um, for the first line of a query letter or a book. Um, I would phrase it um, more like, uh, we, we don't even know what Jody's relationship to the Williams is, is either, which is problematic. So I would say more um, as Jody watched the, you know, crime scene detectives tape off, who are the Williams, her friends, her parents, her, you know, neighbors, um, house, um, if she would have done things differently, hindsight is a bitch. That's all you need. 
After the sudden and tragic loss of her daughter, 30-year-old journalist Jody Anderson uh, moves to sought-after gated community Kensington Grove for one reason, to hide from the shadows of her past. Too bad she's moved in next door to Nora Williams and her terminally ill daughter, Lacey. Okay, so now we're getting the information after the fact, which is um, kind of like rewinding of VHS. Um, Though her instinct is to stay as far away from Lacey as possible, she can't help but notice there is something off about the Williams household. When the local doctor commits suicide, Jody is convinced things are not as they seem and sets out on a mission to uncover the secrets of the supposedly idyllic suburb. But in a town where no one believes the new girl, she'll have to come back uh, face to face with her own demons if she's to have any hope of getting to the bottom of things and surviving this community. Good talk. We love like a weird gated community hook. Um, again, I think that after that first paragraph, we hit rewind a little bit, and that's what doesn't work for me. So what I would say, um, I would have that first paragraph, as we discussed, ends with hindsight, hindsight is a bitch, um, and then just kind of say, uh, Jody would, you know, would never have guessed that um, things would have turned out this way um, after moving to Kensington Grove, uh, after the tragic death of her daughter. Um, she thought it would be the perfect sanctuary for her. But then she noticed things uh, starting to be amiss, um, including with her neighbors, the Williams, who you've already introduced as, as her neighbors in the first paragraph, hopefully. Um, uh, and then that ending is okay. The local doctor commits suicide. She's convinced things are not as they seem. Um, that ending is okay. The, the first half of that second paragraph is, is a little bit of a rewind and ex- explanation. Um, so just kind of get rid of that and cut to the chase and then it'll, it, it would be stronger. Um, out of position, save me beside novels such as little fires everywhere by Celeste Ng and the girl on the train by Paula Hawkins. Um, I'm also in the middle of outlining another domestic thriller set on a cruise ship. That's a fun detail. Um, I wouldn't put it in here. Um, I think, I mean, it doesn't hurt to have it in there. It's not going to be the make or break detail. Um, but if in you're you're really pitching your book that you're out on submission with right now, and if an agent is interested in your work, um, you'll have that phone call and you'll they'll ask you um, what you're working on next, and then that'll come up. But um, you really mostly want to keep the focus on the book that you're out on submission with in your query letter. Um, again, as mentioned earlier, I would add little details about why it's like little fires everywhere and why it's like the girl on the train. Um, those are also, I mean, again, it's not problematic, um, but those are also both very big comps. And um, it is, I really is a strong word, but um, publishing professionals react with a bit of skepticism if you compare to, you know, my book is John Clancy meets John Grisham, or my book is Stephen King meets, um, you know, Don, a ton of French or something. Um, it's a little bit much if you compare your book to, you know, three New, number one New York Times bestsellers or franchise authors or something. Um, so it's not, again, it's not wrong. Um, if those are truly the best comps that you can think of for your book, go with God. Um, and no one's going to reject your query or your book based on that alone. And if they do, you don't want to work with them. Um but I would maybe think if there's a little more nuance there um, with the girl on the train, little fires everywhere is a little more of a stretch. Now there's like the Hulu series, um, but it, it, it's a, it's not bad. Um, it's a pretty good comp. I work full time as a writer and editor for a parenting magazine. My passion has always been fiction. I live in Surrey where I'm raising a little reader of my own. That's a cute bio. I like that bio. Good job. Um, I hope you enjoyed the extract. I look forward to hearing from you in due course. That's a good ending. Um, it's not my it's not my copy and paste line, but that's a good ending. Um, that was a good query letter. That was a good query letter. My 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 main problem was that it was a little too expositional in the front paragraph, and um, then did a little bit too much of a rewind um, explanation in the in the second. That was good. I'm ready for the next one, cool. Martin. Whenever you're ready to scroll. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me at all? Oh, you might not be able to hear me. Work, work. Oh, okay, we're going. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. I might be able to fit two more in if I go faster. <clears throat> Oop, okay. Uh, Dear Juliet Collins, I'm writing to seek representation for my 88,000-word memoir, there's, a, there's One Among Us. Given your interest in unexpected or unheard voices, I believe it could be a good fit. Um, uh, that's good. It's a little more generic than the I read your interview in X or I saw you were representing... Um, 
specifically, you know, LGBTQNA voices, or um, I really admire X author on your list. Um, this personalization is, I don't mean generic in a bad way. Um, this could just be the point of connection the author has with the agent. I would move that down to after the plot synopsis, because this is, um, I don't mean it to sound harsh, but this connection is weak enough where um, I don't think it's the strongest part of the query letter. Um, I, I think the plot is probably the strongest part. Um, when I was 10 years old, my mother was violently killed and my father was addicted to drugs. See, that, see, I was right. That's a stronger start than the thriller. That is a strong start. That makes me want to read more. In spite of my father's addiction, he was granted full custody of me, even though I didn't even know him. He was never... It's a thriller. If this is a novel, then this might take a little longer because we're going to need to have a talk about writing a query letter. Oh, memoir. Okay, good. I, I had thriller in my head. Awesome. This is good. I was worried. Query letters written in character do not work. Don't write query letters in character. Um, they never work. <clears throat> memoir. This is fine. Uh, he was granted full custody of me, even though I didn't even know him. He was never home, so I was being raised by his wife, who is not only abusive, but consistently made it clear she did not want the additional responsibility. After an exhausting court battle and significant back and forth between homes, my aunt, who had been like a second mother to me, won custody. <clears throat> Living with her turned out to be the only marginal improvement, as she surprisingly was nowhere near the person I'd thought or hoped. In spite of my tumultuous childhood, by the age of 30, I'd graduated from Harvard University with a Bachelor of Business Administration, graduated from Harvard University with a Master of Business Administration, Bachelor of okay, uh, and was one of the very few African-American female investment bankers on Wall Street. I went on to become a Wall Street executive and worked for some of the most prestigious finance institutions in the world. There's one among us as the unusual and inspirational memoir of a girl who has survived loss, abuse, and life-changing setbacks yet managed to forgive and achieve extraordinary success against the odds. Um, I'm just going to briefly pause there and say that that's very strong. Um, I would jigsaw puzzle that up a little bit more. Um, and I would uh, mention your success story in that first paragraph. So I would say um, the line about, you know, when I was 10 years old, my mother was violently killed and my father was addicted to drugs. And then I would say right there, um, nobody at the time would have guessed that I would be X, Y, Z. Um, I always feel really weird about critiquing memoirs because they're someone's life. Um, but uh, memoir is a hard category, especially in a genre like this, because um, you, you don't, people don't want to immerse themselves in uh, hardship and, and difficulty and misery. Um, they want to, but they will immerse themselves in hardship and difficulty and misery if it's a success story and a triumphant story about how you overcame that. And so reading that first paragraph, I was getting a little like, oof, this sounds really good, but I'm not sure if, if I can immerse myself in this character and in this world um, for this long, for the length of a book. And so I think by offering them that light at the end of the tunnel and saying, bear with me, it gets better, or don't worry, it's hard, but then there'll be a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, that's what would help me keep reading. Um, and then even with that one line added, I think you could then go into the family dynamics um, and have a little bit more of that. Um, you know, you, you have a little more attention because we, we feel safer knowing that it will turn out well for you. Um, so that's what I would do there just to kind of allay those concerns. Um, I, I, it's really convenient that this is your memoir because that kind of serve that second paragraph serves as your author bio. And obviously um, you're very accomplished and um, successful and that's incredible. And I am really interested in your story. Um, uh, Martin, would you scroll down a little bit to the, if, if I think there's more after, right? Oh, no, that's okay. This book will appeal to various groups, including adults and young adults, subjected to adverse childhood experiences. ACEs, African-Americans who can relate in many of the cultural descriptions in the book, those with an interest in different ethnic groups, and memoir lovers. In J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, he refers to the African-Americans who had lived just next to him and experienced many similar cultural issues he describes in the book. There's one among us is from that. That's, that is a really good comp. Saying, here's this hit book, he talks about this, but he's not from this community. I'm from that community, and I will talk about it. 
that's a really effective way to do a nonfiction comp. Good job. That's really good. Um, I love that you're doing little um, marketing and publicity blur, not marketing publicity blur, but, but, but targeting readers of your book already. That's really effective. Um, the one thing that I would just drop in here is be careful of saying um, that your book will appeal to adults and young adults. Um, that's probably true and that's really good. Um, but be care that might be a line that you tinker with um, because if you are querying an agent who works mostly in adult nonfiction and memoir, um, they're going to look at that young adults line and say, ooh, not for me. Um, if you're querying an agent who works primarily in young adult nonfiction memoir, they're going to see that line that m mentions adults and says, ooh, not for me. Um, so you're going to want to tinker with that a little bit based on who you're querying. Um, if you're querying an agent um, like myself, who represents both not, uh, adult and young adult, um, nonfiction, then that would be okay to keep in. But just make sure that you're not alienating an agent who sees that and thinks, oh, this crosses over into a genre that I don't have experience in. Um, just be mindful of that. Um, okay, Martin, where are we? Oh, I know it's we have about 10 or 11 minutes left until the unofficial cutoff. Um, do you want to do one more? Do you want to jump to Q&A? What's your, what's your vibe? I think maybe he's going to pop back on in a minute. He's not on my screen. It could be my problem. I don't see Martin. <laughs> um. Oh, there's a little gray screen. The document is back. Oh, hi. You can't hear. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> Okay, cool. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. That's fun. My headphones are on, right? Yep. I'm gonna take a sip of water. Um, okay. I'm assuming since we're stopped, this is the one that we're reading. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking for love, please. Dear, Mr. Dear Ms. Collins, um, I'm a second-generation Greek-American who grew up with immigrant parents who fed me delicious spanakopita and taught me how to folk dance for fun. That's fun. Uh, as you might expect, I write about Greek-American heroines who love their Greek culture as much as I do. That's a great opener. Um, it tells me about your personality. Um, again, I might, like, if, if the agent is Greek American or talks about their Greek heritage um, or represents, you know, books in the Greek American area, um, that's a really strong opener. Um, again, I think that it might be something that goes um, after the, the, plot description as kind of an about the author thing um, if if the agent doesn't have that specific connection. My protagonist, L. Petropolis, is a baklava-loving New York's divorce attorney who doesn't believe in the institution of marriage, but must tie the knot before her cousin in order to inherit her grandmother's beach house on the island of Crete. Love that. If she loses, her cousin will sell the home to a developer to pay off her student loans, and three generations of family history will be lost. Will Elle stay true to herself or compromise her values to win the marriage contest? That's fun. A little short. Um, it works for me. Uh, I think it's strong enough that it, it kind of pulls its weight. Um, I would give a little more about um, what kind of... <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not contradicting myself because I don't want to get into plot synopsis. But I think even saying something like... Um, you know, what Elle doesn't expect is the um, land developer who wants to destroy the house um, but is a, a super fox. Or, um, you know, the the opposing divorce attorney uh, for her case while she's struggling. Like, I think we know from the setup that she will probably find someone and begrudgingly fall in love with them. Um, 
I would set up a little bit who that person might be um, just so that we, we get a sense of the other player because I feel like that's going to be an important part of the book. So I'd add a little bit more um, to, to kind of flesh out our expectations of the book, but that's very strong. Looking for Love is an 80,000 word humorous women's fiction novel that will appeal to the fans of Her- Hannah Ornstein's Love at First Like, Kemper Donovan's The Decent Proposal, and Nia Vardalis's My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Obvious great comp. Um, those are really good comps. Um, excuse me one minute. I'm going to scratch my nose. I don't want to be on camera. Um, that's a, those are really good comps. Um, they fit exactly what I said earlier. They're not like mega bestsellers, but they're successful books that give you a sense of plot, tone, and character. Um, you, uh, with Nia Vardalis's My Big Fat Greek Wedding, um, you are allowed, a lot of people don't do this. That's fine you are allowed to comp to TV shows and movies and stage plays and, you know, whatever, even, um, random things, um, like, uh, 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 like, a you know, with the vibe of a, you know, a kid's softball game played on a rainy day, like you can, if it's that specific and it gives a sense of strong atmosphere, um, your comp doesn't have to be a book. Um, you should, it shouldn't be, there should be books in there. You can't just do movies and TV shows, but you could say, um, you know, with Celeste, the, the whatever of Celeste Ng and um, the, you know, crime thriller aspect of CSI or whatever, that is, is totally fine. And I think especially in this case, um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding gives you a strong sense of what it's going to be about. So that, that really works for me, and that's a smart idea, and you can do that. Um, as a baklava-loving Greek-American who has been over a hun- on over 100 dates in New York City, I'm qualified to write this book. Great bio. I'm also a member of the Women's Fiction, with writers, 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 blah, 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 Women's Fiction Writers Association and Romance Writers of America. Strong bio. Again, I think you could easily combine that first paragraph with the second one and um, talk about even more why you're the person to write this book. Um, Given your interest in commercial women's fiction with multicultural themes, I love Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians. I'm assuming that this fictional agent might represent Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians. Um, if they don't, then bump Crazy Rich Asians up to um, the comps above. Otherwise, that's a weird spot to, to throw it in. Um, if the agent does represent Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians, that's a good spot for it, and you can keep it as is. I think Dating Girl might be a good fit for your list. I've included the first 10 pages for your review. I hope they keep you up all night reading. That is a cute query letter. That's a really good query letter. Um, I would mostly change the order of things a little bit, and I would expand on the plot just a smidge more. But the tone, excuse me, the tone is a perfect representation of what I think would be in the book. The comps are specific and strong. Um, The the author platform and background is... uh, is the type of person that you'd want to write this book. It's authentic, um, both in the dating aspect and in the, um, in the, the cultural aspect. Um, and it's personalized, um, to the agent as well, or it could be, um, I don't know enough details about the fictional, um, Ms. Collins. So, um, but that's a really good query. Like that's a really strong one. This, um, could be used as a, as a very good template, um, for other people. Ryan's going to type to me, I think. Um, if there are questions and you can type them, can I turn your volume up? I can. I can also, okay, it's all the way up. Uh, and I refresh the app. Yes. I don't know why I'm keeping quiet. I mean, can you hear me? See, give me, I hope that I'm able to log on successfully after this. One moment, please. This is a, it's a weird three-way thing. Okay, folks at home, hopefully uh, he'll be back on. He'll be able to hear me because uh, uh, I'll have to uh, read your questions out but stick around uh, we're going to be here for another 10 minutes uh, and fantastic give me a second because they can't hear you yet okay. and here you are I can hear you we're That's good it. we're back okay cool that was amazing uh, what was it I'm going to actually refresh this a bit myself so maybe I could pull some questions in uh, from the side but <laughs> I'll keep your questions in here I'll be back in a second It's just us, guys. Um, let's share some secrets. I apologize for the pandemic here. I haven't gotten a haircut since March. So 
It's a little crazy right now. Talking about my hair. <laughs> uh, yeah. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, I think last Reedsy Live, people were mentioning that Sean, my own hair off, but... Uh, uh, and that's the move. I, I'm, I'm almost there, I think. But anyway. Um, okay, so I think I can remember a few, um, including, like, do you, do you tend to have, like, a length that you like? Uh, were there other ones, like, a bit on the long side for you? Um, I'm... What's that? I'm going to change locations really quickly because I just got the 10% battery warning <laughs> and I don't want to <laughs> die. So I am going to go into my other room, which will have poor lighting and will be less atmospheric, but which will allow me to charge my phone. Okay. I did unplug my headphones to charge my phone, so can you hear me at all? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I yeah, can do you. Okay. Good, excellent. Um, and I apologize again. For <laughs> so you can see that I had the lighting like very flatteringly set up in, in the other location and now it's um it's all gone to bunk um length i would say um i i would keep it a, as a page um you can fiddle around with that a little bit um like if you're doing a page that's 12 space uh 12 size font and like you could knock it down to 11 size font or um do single spacing or if you have um you know, your, your address at the top left corner, you can delete that to make it fit better. Um, you can definitely tinker around with it a little bit, but um, a page is about right. And then it does, I know a lot of agencies, excuse me, including Avidis, where I work, um, has like forms that you just copy and paste, you know, your bio into one slot and your, um, your, your synopsis into one spot and your comps into one spot. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit bit of room to play around but um if you're typing it out and drafting it in a word processor um try to keep it to a page cool uh here's a quick file question uh genre and word count should you always include that yes yeah cool. i would like in that um <clears throat> so the template that i usually do and again my readsy clients will will recognize this is i usually start dear agent and then do the two or three paragraphs of plot synopsis and then bring in the title of the work and say, um, you know, title is a X word thriller um, with serious potential with that, that uses the literary leanings of, you know, Stephen King with the plot of Celeste Ng or something. And then I'll do the author bio after that. So that's kind of the order that I usually go in, but yes, put, Title and word count and 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 uh, genre in there definitely. Uh, someone has asked: Is comedy a genre? Um, no. <laughs> um, it, it it gives a good description of what the book is, but it's not. I don't. I don't believe that there's like a comedy um, bisac. Um, I would say. Uh, I I would say it's a it's a novel, um, maybe a commercial novel, um, with strong humor elements in the vein of comp one and comp two or something like that. Uh, cool. Uh, was it someone asked about, uh, should you be trying to write your query letter within a literary style that matches your book? That's a great question. Um, yes and no. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a boon if you can communicate the voice of your book through your query letter. Um, that's definitely going to be really um, engaging shorthand for an agent to read your query and go, that's something I want to read more of. Um, if you, the query letter, I think everyone in the publishing industry is very aware that query letters are a weird and specific form that is hard to write within. And you, you will not be dinged um, if your query letter is more formal or more literary or um, more whatever than your book. Um, it's not a necessity, but if you can pull it off, I think it would be more attention grabbing. So uh, how far out of the box would you say is too out of the box when it comes to, like new approaches to your a query letter? Um, I mean, as I mentioned in the, in the discussion part of the stream, um, don't write your query letter as a fictional character. Um, that doesn't work. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, read the, the paperback 
um, the back cover copy of the paperback of whatever books you're comping to and model it off of that. Like if that's a little more gonzo, then you can maybe go a little more gonzo. Um, if they're, I would assume they're a little more straight laced and I would go, um, I would follow the pattern of, um, and the reason I say the back cover copy of paperbacks specifically is because they have a shorter character limit on um, the publisher for that space. And that character limit is, is closer in length to what you will be writing for your query letter than what you will see on a hardcover flap. So a hardcover will be longer than what you want to emulate with your query letter and a paperback um, will be closer to the length that you want. Okay, another quick far one, uh, a debut 200,000 word novel. Too much or not too much enough? Uh, I'm assuming that refers to word count, in which case yeah. my answer is uh, too much. Um, if you Google, I mean, the answers will vary, but if you Google your genre and average word count, you should find something and they sh will not be much over like 100K words. That's, that's definitely more than, um, it, it would scare off an agent that length. Yeah, well, both on their meant they might not be it might not be suitable to be shelved, and also you don't want to sit down and read two hundred thousand words potentially. Exactly. Yes. Uh, okay. Here's another question: uh, What if we can't find any recent comps? Like, how old can the comps be? Um, in if you're like an editor working at a publishing house, I think it's five to ten years um depending on what publishing house you work for when you're when you're comping things in terms of sales in-house so i would follow that same method um i would say you could like if you're taking a novel out on submission right now you could go as far back as 2010 um if it's close to that like if, if it's like 2008 you could probably slip it in um if it was 2000 it might be a little far off you alternatively you can use like one older comp um, from, you know, the nineties or the early two thousands or something. If you have like two or three strong modern comps to balance it, but you can't just say like my book uses, you know, my book is like great expectations meets pride and prejudice. Like that's not going to fly. Like uh, over time, your book has potential to sell loads. Uh... Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> After you're dead, that, that's yeah. Not going to be super helpful. Uh, was it? Someone asked uh, whether now during like pandemic, during the lockdown is a good time to query. How, how is your workload sort of changed by this? That is a good question. Um, it varied, um, you know, kind of month by month early on. Uh, my workload was very slow because we were all adjusting to this brave new world. And I think that, um, that publishers, we're reading slowly and, and writers were kind of not really writing super um, uh, effectively because um, obviously this is a drain on the creative side of your brain. So like March, April, even into May a little bit, it was very slow. Um, now, and then in like May, June, July, um, writers got back into the swing of things and it's been very, very, very busy um, editing and prepping things for submission and, um, you know, doing my reading list. I'm definitely behind on things right now. Um, I'm treading water a little bit more. Um, and I think as we enter August, um, my colleagues and I at the agency are discussing, um, you know, submission strategies and everything. And, and I think that we're kind of landing on um, that August is not a good time to go out because people are underwater um, and kind of overwhelmed and they're feeling really tired. Um, so we're not going out to like editors at publishing houses with submissions in August just because they're fried and they don't have the attention span. Um, I think it's, if, if you're, if an, look, if an agent is really burnt out, they will close to queries. So if they're still open to queries, I would say that it's acceptable. Um, I would just give, uh, give them more time to read and be more gracious to them. And, um, you know, if they're the type of agent where, they will respond to you one way or the other and, you know, maybe give them a little more time to respond before pinging them and, and saying, um, Hey, just checking in. Have you, have you gotten to this yet? Cause we're all struggling. I've got a, an inside baseball question from Devin Sandyford. Uh, if the agent, I imagine this is an agent that you've already queried. 
If the agent asks if your proposal is out with other agents, what answer are they really looking for? Uh, that depends on the stage at which they're asking. Um, if they have read your query letter and are, and are responding and saying, um, I'd love to read this. By the way, is it out with other agents? Um, my guess is that that would lead to them asking for some sort of an exclusive um, on it, which you're not enti- they're not entitled to, um, and I would not give it to them. Um, if they are interested in representing your proposal and they're saying, who is this out with? Um, that's basically them saying, you know, I don't think it's the best way of saying this, but I would guess that's their way of saying, um, you know, do you, do you, I'm interested in working with you. Um, do you need more time to circle back to other agents who you know might be reading and say, Hey, I have an offer. Um, can you get back to me within two weeks? Um, so it could mean two different things depending on the stage. One is not so good and one is good. Cool. Uh, I've got one last question and we'll wrap up with a few other things. Uh, Vicky Acer says, should you send a query if you aren't finished with your manuscript? No, 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 no. Never send a query <laughs> before you're finished with your manuscript. You should have a final, edited, complete, like, you are done touching it manuscript before you send to an agent. Um, that is why, uh, as I said earlier, when I have my go-to line, <coughs> excuse me, that I use at the end of queries, um, my line says I have the complete manuscript available upon request. Um, do not query before you have a complete manuscript. You are not ready. And if an agent requests the full manuscript um, and you say that you don't have it, it will burn your relationship with that agent. Do not do it. So you've never like received like an amazing query. You're so excited. And the last line is, so do you think I should write this thing? That would be terrible. Although I, I will say one of the tips that I give writers who are writing their queries is um, I, I think that a lot of times it can be beneficial to, to write your first draft of the query before you write the book. Um, not only to like kind of get a sense of what the book you want to write is about, but uh, just kind of shape it in your head. And then it, I've heard that it becomes less intimidating when you're done with the book and you revisit that first draft because you're not summoning something out of nothing. You already have that draft. Um, and it can be kind of fun to see how the book has changed as you've written and edited it. So I guess like the, the asterisk to that is like never go out on query to an agent before you've finished your book. But you may find it a helpful thought exercise to write a first draft of your query before you write the book and kind of use that as um, a way to articulate and conceptualize what you're trying to accomplish with the book that you're writing. Cool. Awesome. Uh, all right. Yeah. On a sort of related note to that, uh, we had a, uh, a webinar a couple of weeks ago on log lines with a very similar thing, the idea of like creating the line by which you'll sell and pitch your book yes. as a way to sort of focus how you write it. Like if you can't sort of explain it in your 10, 15 second, like quick pitch and you probably don't have a story or you probably don't know quite what your story is. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Uh, cool. Uh, a couple more things before you go. First of all, uh, query lesser reviews. I know you do it for us. Uh, what should folks know about uh, well, the way you do it, how how they can get in touch with you to uh, request the query lesser review? Yeah, I think you can just search for me on, on Readsy. I'm, I'm under John Darga, J-O-N, um, D-A-R-G-A. Um, I, 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 I got this um, question recently. Um, an author was just like, what does a query letter review entail? Um, a lot of times, to be completely honest, it involves me. Uh, I described like the, the query letter that the client gives me as the jigsaw puzzle pieces and then like the picture on the box. And then my query letter edit is putting the puzzle together. So a lot of times it's me using the language and the information that the writer has in their first draft of the query letter, but kind of piecing it apart and piecing it back together and kind of rewriting it, um, but using their first draft as a blueprint. Um, sometimes it involves um, me tagging things with comments and saying, like, for instance, if we were um, 
if we were doing like that first query letter that I read on the on the live event today and I had questions about, you know, okay, here are these three characters, Norman and Daniel and I forget the third one's name, um, you know, maybe an adjective about their personalities. I couldn't add that in as a, an editor because I don't know what their personalities are because I haven't read the book. So that would be like me putting a comment in the query letter and saying, can you add in an adjective about their personalities here? Um, and I always do, uh, in, in my edits, I always allow for um, two rounds of edits on query letters because I haven't read the book. And so I think it's important to do one pass of it and then have allow an opportunity for the, the client to come back to me and say, um, you kind of missed the tone on this one a little bit, or you implied that this conspiracy was um, going to destroy the world if they didn't stop it. But actually that's not the case. Um, and kind of correcting those things and allowing for a second round. So that's kind of what my query letter work with Readsy looks like. Cool. And uh, we've had some questions generally asking what query letter reviews cost. It sort of depends depending on who you query. Uh, were you on Readsy, you can sort of tag like uh, up to five editors, I think, who offer the service and then shot them out. John, do you have a standard rate that you're happy to share? I do. My, I, I don't want to burn any other um, editors, but my standard rate is um, I have a flat rate of $100 uh, for a query letter review. And that, as I mentioned, en encapsulates two rounds of edits on it. Um, and that's my flat rate for a, a query review. Cool. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you work as a full blood editor here on uh, Reedsy, copy editor and full manuscript. That any sorts of projects that you're really keen to work on at this point that are, if the folks out there have a, a project like this, they should send you away? Yeah, um, not so much in, in, well, that's a lie. I, I always find it fun to, um, uh, to edit like a, a thriller or a kind of a commercial um, uh, novel in, in a plot driven genre, like a thriller or a, um, or a mystery or, or something like that. Um, I think it's just, it's a little more of the puzzle piece um, work for me to say like, ooh, I don't know if this aspect of, you know, why does he go to to from Sudan to Tokyo? Like that clue doesn't really add up or, um, you know, this murder, you know, clue doesn't really lead to this suspect. Um, that work is really fun. Um, but no, I, I earlier this in quarantine, I did some fantasies um, that was really fun because I got to write an edit letter that kind of focused on world building a little bit more. And I gave tips and tricks on some of the authors um, about how to really flesh out their fantasy world and, and, and make sure that their characters felt realistic and vibrant uh, within this this fantasy setting. Um, I did some memoirs earlier this this summer, um, and that was some some rewarding work. Um, thinking about um, these these personal stories and, and how to make sure that the themes of their life that they want to come through are coming through. Um, so I maybe maybe it's because I've, I've done mostly fantasy novels and memoirs this summer that I kind of want to do like a, a mystery or a thriller because I haven't um, edited that genre in a while. Um, but I'm open to anything. I, I think that... Um, I think that a lot of times what makes a good book makes a good book. And obviously there are nuances um, in stories, like a, st a murder mystery on a spaceship is going to kind of be a slightly different book than a murder mystery in a Scottish castle. Um, but the bones are going to be the same. You know, the, 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 each clue still needs to lead to the next suspect. And the world building is going to need to be as strong in a Scottish castle as it's going to be in a Martian spaceship, because a lot of people haven't been to a Scottish castle and they don't know how that works. So the bones are the same. Um, so yeah, that's that's my long answer to a, to a short question. Hey, nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll cut it down to a, a paragraph in the edit, don't worry. Thank you, uh, you're, you're a great editor. <laughs> those of you who signed up to this will be having a, a sort of transcript of sorts probably coming out. It's a bit tougher with these critiques, but we tend to try to compile some of the, uh, the relevant notes uh, and we'll be sharing with you if you uh, have signed up uh, through the Readsy newsletter. Uh, one more thing, I've dropped a link to our Eventbrite page. We've got a bunch of great uh, webinars coming up very soon. Uh, in two weeks' time, uh, I'll be actually in Scotland in a Scottish castle, but someone else will be replacing me. Uh, and they'll be uh, doing a webinar on characters with uh, Caroline Levitt, 
uh, whose upcoming novel, With or Without You, I believe is out next week. She's fantastic. I really love her. Uh, whenever she does something on structural characters, it's it's been amazing. So sign up for that one. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and I believe uh, we're trying to put something together with you and Becca Heyman. Uh, yes. In the future. So you got to get back to me and send me some details for that one. I will. Yeah, Becca and I will we'll get together. It's a, She's a dream partner, and I'm so excited for whatever we're going to have to offer. I think we're going to do maybe like first paragraph um, instead of first sentence, but oh, it's, it's, it's TBD. Yeah. Speaking of which, if you're fans of the First Line Frenzy, follow Reedsy on Instagram. Um, me and Becca recorded two more bonus episodes offline that I've uh, just finished editing. So uh, there were, first, we did two episodes before. We've got two more coming up. Uh, just go on there. They're great bonus content. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, everyone at home. Really appreciate you sticking around and spending a Wednesday with us. Catch you soon. Bye. Thanks, Martin.